it's like it takes a force of nature, right? That something outside of man's control. So either the amount of gold that we can extract from the earth every year or so, um, same thing with oil and the energy that is required to extract both of those things from the earth um, is, is sort of a constant or at least not something that humans can change. And so it, uh, it takes the power out of the hands of a centralized authority and currently right now the federal reserve bank of the united states um and that's bitcoin is the same thing right we're using energy to create money and it's an energy intensive process when you so you, you know you were talking about how you didn't really approach it with the technical understanding but i assume you have like a basic understanding of like the the uh difficulty adjustment which is really interesting uh, which gold and oil can't have, obviously, um, you know, there's more and more of an incentive to mine gold or to extract oil from the ground if the price goes up. Um, but the difficulty of the mining doesn't necessarily change in accordance with that incentive. Um, so what do you think about the, the difficulty adjustment? You know, every two weeks we adjust based on, uh, trying to target that 10 minute block block time. Um, does, is that an improvement on energy-based money, do you think, or, uh, or not? In, I think it's ultimately depends on what you want to solve for. I think if you want to solve for the hardness of the money, absolutely, mm -hmm. I think it is. Uh, yeah. If you want to solve for flexibility relative to um, – human population growth or other externalities, then there are those that would argue gold is still superior. Um, mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think it's easier to just solve for hardness of money. And if that's the case, then yeah, I think that is an improvement on it. Um, you know, historically gold had, that was the, before the technology side of it, gold had its own uh, difficulty adjustment, right? It's, it's, you know, a hundred years ago, they were picking up chunks of gold, huge chunks of gold off the ground. And, you know, in Cal, maybe 150 years ago in California and in Colorado. And now you got to go two, three miles down for it. And so there's this natural uh, difficulty adjustment that's always existed with it. The other thing that was always true of it was that its supply grew at, call it one to one point, one to two percent uh, over time, Kager long term. And up until 1850, from the time of Christ until 1850, human population grew roughly 1% Kager. So those two things pretty much um, moved along together. And so what happened in 1850 was with the advent of fossil fuels really expanding uh, a massive, un, un, you know, unseen in history up to that point, productivity boom, uh, human population responded. So human population, after growing a percent Kager for nearly 1900 years proceeded over the next 150 years to grow 6% Kager. And so I think in no small part, a lot of what the, the, the craziness we've seen in terms of human interactions since 1850 have been trying, as it relates in particular to economics and, and geopolitics, has been around trying to marry this 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 old, you know, the gold standard where supplies are growing one and uh the the uh, at, uh the human population uh, which is growing six and which productivity is rapid rising rapidly mm -hmm. you get this deep fundamental mismatch if you don't let the price of gold float in yeah. fiat terms and the whole time when you when you peg gold to fiat and then your population grows six percent your productivity goes up a bunch it's very deflationary it creates a whole bunch of problems they if they would have just let the price of gold float in fiat terms, it'd have been fine all along. When again, to float in fiat terms, you basically have to peg the gold to the energy. Just basically say, hey, it's not, it's not thirty-five bucks. You know, it's not thirty-five bucks an ounce. It's, you know, it's it's twenty or a hundred barrels, you know, per ounce, and adjust that as the supplies of energy go up. Uh, right. Bitcoin sort of does all that on its own, um, yeah. and 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 so. Under the, that was my sort of base of understanding when when I first saw Bitcoin, and so when I when <laughs> that's why I say when when I saw it from the energy side, I go, oh my gosh, that totally makes sense. Like, yeah, uh, that's uh, um, you know, the, the, the that's 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 sort of how I've thought about it. Yeah, uh, it, it, I've 
it's a really interesting perspective and way to approach or like think about Bitcoin um, that I hadn't really seen before. And I see a few comments in there that to the same extent uh, that, that it's framing it from the, uh, you know, comparing it to gold and oil. And I hadn't thought about the idea of pegging gold to oil as a potential solution uh, and letting the fiat float against it. That's fascinating to me. And having uh, an invention that sort of does makes that solution happen elegantly and is also, you know, digital and has all of the advantages of being able to transport, you know, for virt virtually free or very little cost relatively to transporting a physical, you know, physical goods.